Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry and promotes the highest standards of patient care with today's top experts in the field. Now here's your host, Dr. Joel Berg. We are here today with Dr. Matthew Weed. Dr. Weed is a totally blind and very brittle type 1 diabetic three-time Yale graduate, including his Ph.D. in genetics earned in 2004. He also has master's degrees earned at Princeton and Harvard. During his dissertation work, he was an informal advisor on international policy on embryonic stem cell and human cloning research to the acting director of the National Institutes of Health. After six years of postdoctoral work in bioethics and medical education at Yale, Dr. Weed became the interim associate director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's $150 million Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, which he helped launch in 2010 to 2012. Matthew co-created one of the first methods for making electronic text available to the blind in 1990. He has worked with and mentored hundreds of student volunteer caregivers, many of whom are now in careers in healthcare and health policy. He's working with people at a variety of institutions to find cost-effective ways to lower the barriers to millions of elderly and disabled Americans to live independently uh, and productively. Matthew skis, he kayaks, he has completed a rollerblading marathon and has traveled around the world twice. Among his other projects, Dr. Weed is an accessibility consultant for colleges and corporations. He completed a contract on web accessibility with the National Institutes of Health in 2021. He is also co-developing tools and techniques to help people who aren't comfortable with technology learn how to use smart devices so they can become full participants in our information-driven society. Dr. Weed, thanks for being with us today on Pedo Teeth Talk. Thank you, Dr. Berg, for having me today. Well, Matthew, you and I have, I've gotten to know you over the last months, and it's been an enlightening conversation for me, and I wanted to share some of what I've experienced with our audience will be very interested, and particularly in the topic today, which is going to be optimizing outcomes for patients with chronic illnesses and disabilities, because pediatric dentists and other dentists care for many patients with special needs and disabilities, and particularly pediatric dentists, we often are called upon to care for those with disabilities in childhood, but also in adulthood, because it's hard to make that transition. So today we're going to hear your take on that. But before I begin the conversation, uh, it is important that I tell our audience that you will lead, you, Matthew, will lead an important continuing education course to be held on October 29th of this year, virtually, managed by Oregon Health and Sciences University. The topic there is access improvement for patients with disabilities. Audience can sign up for this important program in the link online. I'll ask you, Matthew, to tell me more about this later on in the podcast. So to start out, tell us about uh, the prevalence of chronic health needs in the United States. Yeah, let's, I think that big picture piece is super, super important. Um, According to data from the CDC's weekly morbidity and mortality report published in 2016, 26% of American adults have at least one disability, and two in five people over 65 had at least one disability. A 2017 study from the RAND Corporation shows that 150 million Americans are chronically ill in some way or other. Back to data from the CDC, more than 80% of people over age 65 have at least one chronic illness. As of 2020, uh, AARP data shows that at least 53 million Americans are unpaid caregivers for someone with a chronic condition of some kind or other. And of course, as almost everyone listening to this podcast knows very well, there are millions more who are paid caregivers um, in our in our healthcare industry. In short, most of us will face chronic health conditions of some kind or other, or we will face the need to be a caregiver for someone who has 
a, a chronic concern of some kind or other, or we may even deal with being both. So it's a really big deal. And it's a really big picture deal that we, I think, don't deal with very well in terms of thinking about these issues in our health professions training across the board. And of course, that includes dentists and dental hygienists as well. So speaking of dental professionals, you and I met around this course that's coming up and you told me about uh, the work you've done in medical education because our physician colleagues also are not well-trained, but you've made a dent in that by offering a program yourself and getting involved in educating the masses of medical students, for example, and nursing students are probably more advanced. But what are the concerns about the lack? What are the manifestations, the concerns about the lack of health professions training in general in general form of uh, regarding special needs patients. Now, we think we do a good job in patient care in the office, but tell us about the problem as it is given that you're at home taking care of your health. Yeah, I think that's a real big concern because realistically, we don't think in in our health professions training, and I'd, I'd say this is kind of a general thing in terms of whole patient matters. For the patient, um, and we'll kind of touch on this in a little bit, we're making most of our health decisions and doing most of our healthcare tasks outside of the clinic, not in the clinic. So there's a really big problem there if health professionals across the board are not getting exposed to patients and how they function in the real world. But um, let's kind of think for a second specifically about accommodation of patients in the clinic, because that is a concern that uh, reaches into the clinic that we aren't seeing very good results on. Uh, Dr. Lisa Iazzoni up at Harvard, she's at Harvard Med, uh, did a study last year published in Health Affairs that shows that 35.8% of U.S. physicians reported knowing little or nothing about their legal responsibilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and 71.2% of her survey respondents answered questions incorrectly about um, their kind of responsibilities under the um, ADA in some way or other. That's a real big concern because also 20.5% were very undereducated about who makes accommodation decisions and 65 plus percent did not know um, whether they might be at risk themselves in their own practice for lawsuits under the ADA. And 68.4% of U.S. physicians that Dr. Izoni surveyed felt that they were at risk for ADA-related lawsuits because they they knew that their clinics might not be doing a very good job. So this is just one indicator, Dr. Izoni's data, of the really poor training that we're doing of all of our health professionals with respect to disability accommodation in the clinic, not to mention the whole patient issues that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Yeah, and you've, you've talked to me a lot about this at home and the perspective of our training in health professions is either in clinics or in hospitals for the most part, when in actuality, we all know that most health improvement takes place by virtue of behaviors at home. So without understanding that environment, it becomes very difficult. So, so what is the impact then of the limited exposure that you know, health professionals, even in the last years of their training, have to disability in their lives, at least as students, they don't get this. So you're trying to fix this in the medical side and the same in dentistry, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it's really important to note that uh, the Commission on Dental Accreditation also feels that this is a concern. And in fact, this is the first year starting in the fall of 2022 that they are requiring dental schools to do training for their students on patients with special needs. But I think we should also look at some of the bigger the bigger statistics that are driving some of this. Um, as I said before, data from the CDC says that 26% of American adults have at least one disability. Meanwhile, uh, data from Meeks et al. 
publishing in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2019 showed that from 2016 to 2019, the number of medical students who reported a disability to their schools increased from 2.9% to 4.9%. So the number of med students who are reporting a disability and therefore have that personal understanding of what it's like to live with a disability um, is, is far, far below the American adult population. Um, as we'll see in a second, this of course is actually the most friendly cohort that I could find in the literature. Uh, Dr. Sarah, Iz uh, Sarah Walyani, sorry, uh, from the American Medical Association, she published in the Journal of Bioethics of the AMA and showed that of her, of her data group, <clears throat> there were less than 1% of students who had uh, a disability of some kind or other, this relative to an 8.9% population in the 18 to 24 age group who actually had a disability um, across the board in our population. There are even more concerning numbers if you reach back a little bit further into the more kind of senior health professionals. Eichmeier et al. found that from 2001 to 2011, only 0.56% of matriculating medical students and 0.42% of graduating medical students reported physical or sensory disabilities to their schools. Of course, this also means that fully a quarter of those students, or if you could look at it another way, a third, were not uh, completing their, their medical educations. There is very little parallel data for dentists, but there is a little bit. Um, a 2006 study published in the Journal of Dental Education by Aaron D. Johnson showed that only 235 accommodation requests for the <clears throat> national uh, board dental exam, step one at, of the 54,750 students to take it um, actually you know, requested a disability. This is 0.43% of the total population and 150 accommodation requests for the national board dental exam part two were made this from 40,412 applications. So only 0.37% of the board of the dental exam step two were making a disability request. This in the period 1998 to 2003. So you've got about a parallel uh, between at that point, the dental students and the medical students making some kind of disability request. But obviously, that's infinitely far below the total disabled or population. And of course, I touched on those chronic illness population figures earlier. That number is even higher. And we don't have parallel chronic illness numbers, at least not that I could find for the students. But the numbers are really low, given that so much of our healthcare spending is on disability and chronic illness across the board. We will now pause for a word from our sponsor. Do you need additional CE hours but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend the annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's Education Passport, an online learning center where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit Education Passport. We are back with Dr. Matthew Weed, who is the expert on providing education to health professionals on how we take care of people with chronic uh, conditions, special needs, disabilities in their homes, and the place where this is the place where they are going to gain the most help for themselves on improving. Yet all our training is basically in clinics and in hospitals. So. Matthew, we, we talk a lot about holistic care and seeing people as whole individuals. You know, we all learned that in dental school. Don't just look at the tooth. Don't just look at the margins of this restoration I'm placing. 
think about the patient as a whole, as an individual. So why is that concept even more important for people with disabilities or special needs? Well, I think it's really important because um, as you look at people with a, a health challenge, a chronic health challenge, whatever it might be, that chronic health challenge oftentimes is very profoundly affecting their life path and how they move forward. Um, again, touching on medical student data, medical students who had personal exposure and experience of disability were oftentimes far better able to interact with and understand the, the kind of physical and practical challenge that patients were dealing with um, as they moved forward. This in a study published um, in the archives of physical and educational uh, re re rehabilitation by Turvo et al. In, uh, back in 2002. And these kinds of experiences, these whole person experiences really affect attitudes within the American and, and Canadian healthcare systems. And I really think that they impact things like communication, things like um, protocol development. They, they affect all kinds of things. They affect outcomes. And the, all these things, they reduce our length of life. They reduce our life expectancy. They, they really impact us across the board. And yet patients are not being seen as whole people, whether they have a chronic health condition or not. And the whole person experience of life and health is not something that I think we're doing a very good job of in preparing our young health professionals to think about before they get out into the wider world. So you started this education that you do with medical students. And would you say that in looking in dentistry, because you're just you're beginning to embark upon that big task, that very important project of educating dental students, are we in the same place that medical education was? Are you seeing the impact of interprofessional education and improving things a bit? We're 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 moving in the right direction, but the ship of the ship of the healthcare training state is a very hard one to shift its course. Um, yes. We really have a long way to go, and and this is just as true in dentistry as it is everywhere else to get people to integrate as truly integrated healthcare teams to understand all the pieces of people's lives and health situations. Um, and to really see patients as people, not as health conditions. Uh, some data from Lisa Iazoni, again, up at Harvard. Dr. Iazoni published uh, a material last year showing that 82% of U.S. physicians felt that their patients with disabilities had a lower quality of life than their non-disabled peers. I would say that Sometimes this is certainly true, but sometimes it isn't. But my question is, how can these people make a clear judgment and have a clear sense of their patients' lives and their, their kind of situations without getting true exposure to how they live and work in the real world? Because oftentimes people with chronic health needs are very, very good at, at kind of finding workarounds and improving their life situations by solving problems that are common to them every day, whereas the challenge of going into the clinic is not an everyday challenge. So in some ways, they're actually underperforming relative to how they do in their, in their normal lives. Yeah, and I, I think we see that when, with because we have a disproportionate number of patients with special needs as pediatric dentists. I often see, we see that the caregivers, the parents most commonly, for these children are way above their care level than the typically developed patient or the one that doesn't have special needs because they give extra attention to the oral care because the problem is worse if they don't manage it. So what you just said seems true in our pediatric population. So I think I want to talk about this program on October 29th. And even though many will listen to this podcast after that date, uh, it's important to talk about the purpose of this because it relates to your mission related to educating health professionals so tell us a little bit about the goals of that program and uh, how you think th see things unfolding. In, in, I, would, I would call an exciting time. The stars are aligned. We haven't done things perhaps in the right way in the past. The ship is going to be tough to turn, but we have the CODA requirement. We have the American Dental Association on board as well as the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. We have been 
for decades on this subject. Now we can all move together. So tell us about the program and what you see happening in the future. I'm super excited with this program. Um, we have 11 national experts coming in to talk about various parts of this. Uh, several, pay, uh, several experts are going to talk about the clinical accommodations. That, of course, includes uh, yourself and talking about some of the experiences that you have as a pediatric dentist. Um, Dr. Stephanie Munns is going to be talking from the University of Michigan about some of the things they're doing in their brand new clinic to improve um, interprofessional uh, work, to improve outcomes for their patients. Um, we have a number of other people from UCSF and from the University of Texas who are going to talk in the morning. Uh, we have some patients who are going to talk about their experiences of healthcare, um, including a practicing dentist in Oregon who is also who also suffers from a, a dental condition that she needs ongoing care for. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to talk about bringing care to the patient, wherever that patient may be, the power of teledentistry to really impact and change outcomes and the ability of, of people to care for patients where they are as opposed to in the clinical setting. Uh, Doc, Mr. Steve Thorne from Pacific Dental Services is going to talk about his work and his company's work to integrate electronic health records and dental health records so that those parts of a, a patient's health situation are communicating to each other just as the patient's oral health and the rest of their physical health are communicating in their body. Um, more patients are going to talk about some of their life situations. And we have a, a, a dentist who's going to talk about her work in bringing care to geriatric patients um, in their home environments. Um, I'll be talking about my experiences both in the clinic and at home and also about accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act and some of the requirements that people should kind of have a, a sense for and understand as we go. So we're really going to try to bring together as many different perspectives in a kind of whole patient aspect as we possibly can so that people really do get a sense for not only what is possible, but what they can do in their, in their dental operations to improve outcomes for their patients and maybe reduce some of those risks for lawsuits as well. So all these things are going to be really great. And we're hoping that this will be a first step in really thinking about improving access and smoothing out some of those systemic lumps that we have to really improve outcomes for patients in all forms of healthcare. And so we're hoping to work with more universities as we go forward, including Oregon Health Sciences, to really um, make this an ongoing active thing to improve training across the board and improve communication across the whole patient and across the whole healthcare field as well. Well, Matthew, since I met you a few months ago, I, for, as one who speaks perhaps on behalf of many who have cared for patients with special needs for the majority of their career, I think you've helped turn my ship in the right direction. I feel like I was going the right way, but you have really focused our attention in the right place, and that's on the patient. And that's in the place that they live. And I'm very excited, and I think we've, we're going to recruit an army to help you in your mission to to grow the education and dental dentistry. Uh, both in the dental education curriculum, but also in the postgraduate and the in the continuing education realm. And I think this is very exciting. So I really appreciate uh, you being here today. And thanks for being with us on Pedo Teeth Talk. Thank you, Joel, for asking me to come. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk on October 29th. And I'm hoping every single one of the listeners out here will will pick it up either then or um, in its recorded form later on. Yeah, they're all going to be your disciples. So I just, we're all charged, ready to go. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need additional CE hours, but don't have time to travel to courses? Did you attend annual session and want to listen to the audio recordings? Check out AAPD's new Education Passport. The redesigned and improved Education Passport is AAPD's online learning center 
where you can earn CE and listen to audio recordings from all of our continuing education courses and more. Visit educationpassport.aapd.org for more information. For 10% off any product, use discount code TEETHTALK in the Education Passport Store. Pedo Teeth Talk is the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Be sure to check out previous episodes of Pedo Teeth Talk, as well as our other podcast platform, Newly Erupted. All previous episodes are available on our website. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.